Good evening, everybody. This is Raj Tekchanani from Smart Capital. Uh, I have a pleasure of hosting Jonathan Tomley today. Jonathan is a great speaker, very entertainment per entertaining person. You can see uh, in this presentation today uh, how much you know research and knowledge he puts brings to the, uh, to, the to everybody here. Um, quickly going through uh, some you know um, housekeeping stuff. You know everybody is on mute automatically, and except the host and the panelists. If you have any issues uh, with audio visual, please type in the chat box and let me know ASAP and I'll try to fix that. Also locate the Q&A box in the Zoom application uh, that you can type in question and answers in. Yeah, do not type the question answers in the chat box because I will not be monitoring that often. I'll be looking at the Q&A box. Uh, this webinar will be recording and is being recorded and will be sent out to all registered attendees. Uh, to avoid it to going to spam, you know, just make sure that you whitelist my email address. That's raj at smartcapitalmgmt.com. You probably already have a bunch of emails from me uh, for this webinar, so that should be easy. A quick disclaimer, this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not be considered as legal accounting or investment advice. The information in these webinars do not represent an offer to sell or solicitation of an offer to purchase an investment or security. The information presented we believe is accurate and reliable, but again, uh, you can read the rest. And just lastly, I mean, do consult your attorney, financial advisor, or CPA for all legal matters, investment, and specific tax specific situations. So that was my disclaimer. Uh, let me tell you quickly, briefly about me if you haven't heard uh, one of these webinars before. Um, I'm a techie turned full time real estate professional. But my passion for leveraging data remains a constant. Uh, that's what brought me to uh, real estate and looking for leveraging data and uh, all the good things that data has to bring. And you'll see a lot of that in Jonathan also today, which is why I'm so fascinated with uh, Jonathan. I, in my real estate background, I bought my first condo in 2012 uh, just by accident. I was visiting Orlando with a friend and happened to you know, stumble upon these properties that were great, greatly priced. And over the next four years, I bought eight more condos. Then I got a little tired of single family paying too many bills, too many you know uh, taxes and all this stuff. So I went ventured into multifamily, bought my first 15 unit in here in Massachusetts, where I am. I'm in Boston. Uh, my first passive investment was about 155, 51 unit in an apartment complex in Dalton, Georgia. Uh, after that, I took a detour into investing more into passive and becoming an active investor. And now I have invested over 650 units uh, as a GP. I've been invited on multiple podcasts as a guest. I run a couple of uh, Facebook groups as well, which one of them is data-driven multifamily investing. Like I said, data is my passion and I run that group. I'm also part of the Forbes Real Estate Council and I've done some publishing uh, over you know, the last few years, um, bringing in some you know, material that I help uh, passive investors with. Um, some of them I just you know listed out here. I have an email course, an eight-day email course that's called Eight Pieces of Pi. Pi standing for Passive Investor Education, and I've written you know some of these guides to getting started and 99 questions to ask before syndication, and things you must know before investing in a real estate syndication. 50 terms. And now a little bit about our just guest, Jonathan. Jonathan Tomley is the president of and managing director of Two Bridges Asset Management. He also runs a coaching program, MFL, uh, Multifamily Launchpad. He also manages the Multifamily Investment Community Facebook group, which as of this afternoon had 9,613 members. Uh, amazing group, amazing group. If you're not part of it, I'd highly recommend that. Uh, before founding Two Bridges in 2013, he was a partner in real estate firm, TRB Investments. He began his career as a law lawyer and spent over a decade in a top law firm where he focused on real estate and hospitality. Undergrad, uh, he has a, not an undergrad, but I should say a bachelor's degree from Harvard College and a law degree from Columbia University. And a little fun fact that I added on my end, and Jonathan didn't supply me that, Jonathan could as well be a, you know, a tour guide for Japan, especially on Tokyo and Kyoto, where he helped me a lot, you know, finding the, my navigation path when I was visiting Tokyo and Kyoto last December. So great, great guy. And with that, over to you, Jonathan. Market psychology. This is all about how investor psychology affects behavior through the real estate market cycle. Now, Raj had said that this is that I'm very data heavy. I like data, but this is actually a little bit more of a sort of a soft uh, presentation around. So what's going on in investors' minds while, uh, you know, through the real estate investment cycle and, and how you can 
uh, how the typical investor is investing and looking at things and how you can, with knowledge of that, do a better job than the typical investor. So let's jump into it. So here's the overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about investor psychology. We're going to talk about the real estate market cycle itself. Then we're gonna marry the two together and talk about how investor psychology changes through the market cycle. And again, caveat here, I'm talking about the general average investor when I'm talking about market psychology. Uh, and then we'll just talk very, very briefly about where uh, I think we are right now, given everything that's going on. So be like Buffett. I want you to be like Warren Buffett. Raj advertised this program with a quote from Warren Buffett about risk, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but risk, things are risky when you don't know what you're doing, essentially, is the, the idea. I'm a big fan of Warren Buffett because he it breaks down really, really complicated uh, investing concepts into incredibly uh, easy to understand, simple aphorisms. And so here he is. I'm sure you guys all are fans of Buffett, know who Buffett is. But what I want to talk about right now in this section is Warren Buffett has said, now, uh, actually, I can't read this because the video is blocking. Hold on, let me change this around. All right. So since most people get invested, get interested in an investment class when everyone else is. The time to get interested is when no one else is. You can't buy what's popular and do well. And because of this, his guiding philosophy is, I'm sure you've seen repeated over and over and over again, is the reason he's successful is he says, we simply attempt to be fearful when others are greedy and to be greedy only when others are fearful. And that's really that only should be the thing that you focus on in this quote greedy only when others are fearful now this sounds really really obvious right you want to be contrary and you want to sell into you know when everyone's buying and buy when everyone's selling so the question is why is it so hard to be like buffett well the reason is what are called cognitive biases and so you want to know what a cognitive bias is so the definition of a cognitive bias is it's a limitation on objective thinking caused by the tendency for the human brain to perceive information through a filter of personal experience and preferences. It's a coping mechanism essentially that evolved to allow the brain to prioritize and process the vast amount of input that it's receiving every single second of the day. It's the human tendency to make decisions based on rules that we invent for ourselves rather than on data. And while this mechanism is very effective at helping us cope with life and get through our day-to-day -day existence, its limitations can also cause errors that can be exploited. So uh, now the thing, the problem with cognitive biases is that they're very seductive, right? It's very easy to fall into them because they feel right and they feel correct because they jibe with our kind of pre-existing view of the world. Um, if you give in to them, it can result in decisions that are directly opposed to data. And actually, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that oftentimes when you give somebody data that is opposed to their pre-existing bias, they dig in deeper on the bias. They don't, they don't reevaluate the bias based on the data. They dismiss the data based on the bias. Now, this can lead, obviously, to very bad investment decisions. Uh, this is the reason why speculative bubbles exist. And this is the reason why investors tend to ignore Buffett's advice about uh, when, you know, about being scared and being scared when other people are greedy. So no one is immune to this, though. This is the thing. You know, we all think that we're so smart and we're not immune to it. But the fact of the matter is that we are all subject to cognitive bias. It affects everyone. It is an evolutionary response to, as I said, there being too much information in the environment. And that is a problem that is even worse today with social media and the constant bombardment with information and, and basically the, the ability to pick and choose the information we get now based on what we want to see. So you can't eliminate these biases, but you can push back against them. And doing so is going to improve your investment decision-making process. Now, you could make the argument that the greatest investors in the world are successful precisely because they have developed ways of fighting against their own cognitive biases and using the data and using what they understand about markets and using their understanding of risk to make investment decisions rather than listening to what everybody else around them is, is telling them. Okay, so let's talk about what some of the common cognitive biases that affect real estate investors are. Now, this is not a comprehensive list. Uh, this is just a couple that I, put, that I picked for today, what I think are kind of the most important ones. Uh, and I'm just gonna go through the list and then we'll go through which one is about. 
So first is confirmation bias. Then there is in-group bias or herd mentality. There's the bandwagon effect, recency bias, trend chasing bias, gambler's bias, anchoring. And then there is the bias towards stories over data. And this is actually a really big one. This is the one that advertisers use to, to get you all the time. Confirmation bias, what is that? So this is the natural human tendency to A, seek out or emphasize information that confirms and it confirms an existing conclusion that we've already made and B, uh, ignore facts that contradict the conclusion. So for example, this is uh, one again that advertisers use to get you to buy stuff. You know, they, they want you to buy on uh, emotion, they pump you up with emotion, and then they give you a bunch of facts to justify the decision you've already made. So this can result, this confirmation bias can result in overconfidence in your decisions because you're, only, you're filtering in the data that supports your bias and filtering out everything else. You see this in action when people explain or explain away or ignore negative data about say like a property that they wanna buy or a market that they've chosen. And an example uh, is, you know, people who are determined to invest in a particular market, even though the population is declining, just because cap rates are high there and they can give you a dozen reasons why the population decline is absolutely irrelevant to their investment decision won't make a difference. Uh, even though at least for, for me, that's kind of like the first thing that I would, uh, if, if I saw population decline, just uh, turn away from that investment. Um, a tip off that confirmation bias is, is in play with somebody that you're dealing with is when they're dismissive of negative data, when they just don't want to hear it uh, and, protect, and sometimes even get angry at people who point out contrary evidence. All right, the next bias is in-group bias or herd mentality. And this is basically confirmation bias that's applied to groups or you know, echo chambers, right? It's also known as groupthink. Uh, this is a phenomenon that results because like-minded people tend to gather together and then they reinforce their confirmation bias by like talking about the, thing, the stuff that they all agree about and they, they sort of help each other dig in by keeping all the contrary evidence at bay and kind of pumping each other up with the stuff that confirms uh, their own bias. Um, they also tend to express anger at outsiders who come with contrary data. All right, bandwagon effect. This is the tendency of investors to gain comfort from seeing other people doing the same thing. Now, this is where you see the fear of missing out come up, right? They, you see other people doing something like investing in real estate and making money and you want to jump in too. And you, uh, you, that sort of this, that powerful emotion overcomes you and it interferes with your ability to process data. You see this manifesting itself basically in every single real estate cycle or market cycle where you have new investors being drawn in at the top of the market when they see the gains made by the people who bought at the bottom and are selling at the top, right? And we're gonna talk about this in more detail later on about how this phenomenon works, but very often you have uh, new people who get hurt at the top of the market because they only see positive data and they are part of this bandwagon effect where everybody's talking about investing. Uh, you know, one example of this is, you know, basically FOMO, feeling desperate to get into the market and buy something, even if you kind of think we're sort of near the top because you see everybody else doing it around you and you feel this intense FOMO. Uh, another example is investors piling into certain hot markets because they see everybody around them doing it. So they all think that we should invest in, you know, pick a city, Austin, Texas, or whatever the hot market is, uh, Las Vegas until, you know, two months ago, right, was another one because everyone's doing it without looking at the data or thinking about the downside risk. Okay, recency bias. This is a really, really important bias uh, because it really affects how people uh, are looking at the market. So this is the tendency to overweight recent memorable events regardless of the actual facts. So this is the phenomenon behind why, say, people are more afraid of, uh, you know, uh, like airplane crashes than they are car crashes. You know, your chance of dying in an airplane crash is almost nil, but every time there, there is one, it's in the news for days, people tend to overweight that risk. Or terrorism, They're, you know, after 9-11, people were worried about terrorism all the time, even though the risk of being caught in a terrorist, you know, uh, event was infinitesimally small, but, you know, they wouldn't buckle their seatbelts or put on bike helmets, right? So uh, recency bias affects this. Uh, so what, how it manifests in real estate is, people being afraid to invest after a crash when it's actually the best time to invest. Or 
people investing at the peak because their recent memory is all about markets rising and people making money. And they can't, so they, they can't separate out what they're seeing anecdotally in the market from, you know, what the risk profile of the market is. And, and actually, I just, just speaking of anecdotes, on the way home today, I heard this great uh, phrase, somebody said this on the radio, that uh, the, the plural of anecdotes is not data. I thought that was a really amazing quote because I think people tend to pile up anecdotes that support their bias and consider it data and it's not. It's just a bunch of anecdotes. So don't make that mistake. All right. The trend chasing bias is another one that really affects investors. This is the tendency to chase past performance in the mistaken belief that it will continue into the future. And you see this a lot in real estate with people making decisions because based on lists of hot markets, you know, they don't want to actually dig into the data and figure out where the growth is, where the future prospects are. They, they get on some, you know, lazily get on some list that some, you know, real estate journalist, you know, which frankly, you should just cross out real estate in front of that and just say journalist has compiled based on some arbitrary data. You know, they, they pick a point system and they make some top, you know, top 10 lists and people chase that stuff. The, the problem with those lists is that, you know, they're compiled on historical data. And by the time they're published, the chance to make money on them has already passed. It was the people who, the people who made money in those markets are the people who got in there before those stupid lists were compiled and published, right? It's just clickbait but this is trend chasing bias. All right, gambler's bias. This is the idea that, uh, you know, if you guys are all into data, you should probably understand this one very well, but this is the idea that the probability of the next toy cost will be heads has increased because the last 10 flips were all tails. Like we all know that when you, when you flip a coin, it, it, there's a 50, 50 chance it's gonna be heads or, heads or tails. It doesn't matter how many times in a row it's come up heads, the next chance is always 50, 50 but people make the mistake of thinking that it's because it's been head so many times, well, it's gotta be tails next, right? And that just doesn't make any sense. Uh, this is the gambler's bias. Now you see this in real estate where there's this tendency to believe that a market or even a particular property is due for an upswing because other markets have swung up or because it's been down for so long. And you, you saw this a lot, or well, an example that I had in my own investing careers when I first started out, uh, there's a town on the Hudson River Valley called Newburgh, New York. And it is really, really run down, terrible town uh, in the sense that there's just very little to uh, support it there. The industry has left, the jobs have left. I mean, it's, it's, it's really bad off. All the other towns around it had, just, had gentrified and become like second home destinations or weekend tourism destinations. And I made the mistake of thinking, well, every other market in that area has recovered and gentrified. So Newburgh is next. Well, I'm here to tell you that you know, 10 years later, Newburgh is no different than it was 10 years ago. Uh, and that's, that's the result of my gambler's bias. Or you see a lot of people investing in places like Detroit or Cleveland because, well, they've fallen so far, they can't possibly fall anymore. They must be due for a rebound. And, you know, things can go to zero. So uh, don't let the gambler's, the gambler's bias interfere with your good decision making. All right, anchoring bias, another very important uh, bias. This is the tendency to rely too heavily or anchor to a single past reference point or piece of information when making a decision. This again is that, that terrorism, you know, everyone's still thinking about 9-11 when they get on a plane because they're so anchored to that, right? But it has nothing to do with your actual risk. Um, an example of anchoring in real estate is like the classic example is someone moves from New York City or, or Boston where real estate prices are very, very high to a place like Cincinnati where they're low. And they look around and they see what they think is an amazing bargain, but it turns out that they're overpaying for it because they're comparing to what they're anchored to in New York or Boston. It seems cheap compared to that, but it's expensive compared to the local markets. They've made a, uh, an anchoring bias mistake. Or... Another example that was recently very current was investors thinking that an eight cap in Cleveland is great because they're comparing it to cap rates elsewhere, but they're ignoring the fact that 8% cap rate for Cleveland is likely very expensive for that market. And maybe the long-term cap rate there is a 12 or a 15 even. Uh, so again, this is their anchoring to other markets comparing apples to oranges. And then we've got the bias towards stories over data. Now, this is the tendency to value memorable anecdotes over data. And 
the, the, the reason that this is a, a, a exists or this is a problem for investors is that it's much easier for humans to understand and relate to stories than to evaluate data. And that's why you know marketers always use stories rather than facts to sell. Stories engage us, facts make our eyes glaze over. But as an investor, you have to be the opposite way. You gotta dismiss the stories and get excited by the data, okay? Uh, an example of this bias is giving more weight to stories about a few cool businesses moving into downtown Cleveland than to census data that shows you know, massive persistent population loss for six decades with no end in sight, right? So uh, that is, is an example. Or another example is ignoring the danger of investing at the top of the market because you know someone who did fine in the last downturn, right? So you're, you're, the story is he did great, Every, there's nothing to worry about. Whereas the data will tell you this is a serious risk that you need to be considering. All right, so how do you combat cognitive biases in your investing? Well. It really is about focusing on the data, right? So you want to focus, you want to come up with decision-making criteria and action triggers ahead of time so that you're not making decisions based on emotion or based on uh, you know, stories or based on anecdotes or based on what everybody else is doing. You want to make decisions based on independent criteria that you have come up with yourself. So for example, you want to decide on a cash on cash return that you're going to buy at and only buy that cash on cash return. Don't let the fact that other people are doing deals and they're advertising, you know, getting on Facebook and bragging about their deals, uh, let you deviate from your criteria. If you can't find deals that meet your criteria, you don't invest. Or you sell when a certain cap rate has been reached or you sell when a certain return has been reached. You, you take the emotion out of the decision ahead of time. You have to be disciplined and stick to this advanced criteria that you've set for yourself, okay? What I see a lot of people doing is uh, you know, they, they have the cap rate that they want to, that they need to buy at, or they have the cash on cash return that is the right risk adjusted return for them to put their money into. And then what happens is there are no deals that meet that criteria. So they start changing the criteria and all along they'll call themselves conservative investors. It isn't true. If they're deviating from that criteria. They're not a conservative investor. What they need to do is look at more deals until they find one that meets the criteria or be resigned to not doing any deals at all. You have to search for uh, data, sorry, it's missing, for search for data that contradicts your hypothesis. So if you believe one thing about the market, you have to go and search for data that contradicts it and make a decision based on the overall weight of the data. You should always be challenging your own thinking. This is another important thing. Don't just believe your own story, challenge your own thinking. And then it's also good to work with partners who have opposing biases to yours. So let's just say that you are a very, you know, bullish person, you're bullish about everything, you're always optimistic, probably a good idea to partner with somebody who has a more bearish, pessimistic point of view than you do so that you are getting challenged and you know that the decisions you're making are based on, on real criteria rather than just your bullish uh, bias. All right, so now that we've covered kind of the background of the psychology that can kind of interfere with investors' decision-making, let's just run through the real estate cycle itself and then we'll, after this, we will marry the two together. So the real estate cycle was first detected by Dr. Glenn Mueller. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a professor at the, uh, of economics at the University of Delaware, and he uncovered this in the 1990s. Um, if you haven't found this already, he publishes a quarterly market cycle report, which covers more than 50 MSAs. It's really interesting to look at to see where uh, the data is in the marketplace. I'm using his... Uh, uh, his data, his, um, his, uh, you'll, you'll see his graphs. So I want to give credit to him. And if you want to download them yourself, you can find them on the Stewart real estate blog or by searching, just do a Google search for Mueller market cycle report and it'll come up pretty quickly. Uh, this is published every quarter. You can usually get it behind uh, unless you subscribe to his data directly and you can get the most current one. All right, so this is an overview of the market cycle and you'll see here that it has four quadrants starting with point one and going through 16 points before it goes back to point one. And phase one is what's called the recovery phase. We're starting at the beginning of a new cycle. Uh, you then move into expansion, then there's hyper supply, and phase four is recession. Um, I'm gonna go through these, each quadrant in a little bit of detail, but what you'll note here is that, you know, one is the bottom of the cycle, 11 is the top, 
and six and 14 are where uh, the market occupancy has, is equal to the long-term average for occupancy. And that's sort of what everything is, is key to here, all right? Point eight, in case you're wondering why that's green, that's the point as you, as you go up through the market cycle that accelerating rents justify uh, investment in new construction. And, and that's important to the supply demand equation. Uh, and it's interesting that it's at the top and so we'll talk about that in a minute, why it's there. Okay, so the recovery phase, phase one, start with point one, going to point six. Now this is the, the point in the market cycle where the oversupply from the new construction or the declining demand, whatever it was that caused the last cycle to end. And remember, it's always the supply demand balance. You know, we'll be talking a lot about, about oversupply in terms of building, but remember it could, the, the cycle could tip because the demand side of the equation dries up. Okay, so just keep that in mind as we're talking through this so you're not confused. It's only an oversupply issue in, in terms of building. Okay, but in the last, at the end of the last cycle, you've, you've uh, got this, this oversupply from the, the previous cycle and you've got uh, declining demand and occupancy is at its lowest point in that cycle. So at this one, right, the trough of the cycle. And the, the market bottom is de defined as when the excess construction from the last cycle stops. So there's always a point at which it no longer becomes uh, economically viable to start new construction and it all dries up and even projects that are underway, their financing is pulled or whatever and construction just grinds to a halt. Things that are completed are completed and then you, you get to the bottom and there's no new construction. Now, as the bottom is passed, there's no new supply coming in the market, and, but the demand is starting to tick up again. So maybe you're coming out of a recession uh, or even if the economy is, has been steady, you just reach that point where the demand is now starting to absorb the excess supply that's on the market. And what happens is that vacancy starts to decline. So your occupancy is rising and rents, which have been declining because of the oversupply, start to stabilize. And as demand continues to grow, owners are able to start raising rent a little bit, but not yet at the rate of inflation. Okay, so they're not, meet, they're not meeting inflation yet, but they're, they're at least able to get some, some rent growth now. And then, once the market reaches its long-term occupancy average, this is when rent growth is equal to inflation and the market emerges from the recovery phase and uh, it's into the expansion phase. Okay, so in the expansion phase, you have continued demand growth, which is creating the need for more apartments. So occupancy is now climbing past its long-term average and that's allowing rents to start increasing rapidly. So now they're, they're increasing uh, beyond the level of inflation and once they hit a certain level, that makes construction new, new construction feasible, right? Now, what happens at this point is because construction takes such a long time, like it'll, you know, the, the developers will start seeing what's happening and start thinking about new construction once you're at point six, right? But it takes a really long time to hit point eight and then to get permits and then to break ground and like all this kind of stuff. So, so the supply is always going to lag the demand at this point. And what happens is that as new demand exceeds the supply, vacancy keeps dropping, rents keep rising, get really accelerating rent growth and new construction uh, gets improved. And it, you know, the thing to understand about this, it, it's hard to see on this slide, but this expansion period is typically very slow and long, right? So you have, uh, this long period of time uh, where you only have rising rents, right? And that feeds into the biases because you always have new people entering into the market at the beginning of the cycle, like new investors who just come of age or discover an interest in real estate. And so what happens to a lot of those investors is that they can go, you know, like in the current cycle, they've never seen a declining market. All they've seen is, is rising, rising, rising. And that, feeds into their bias about what markets do and interferes with their decision making. Because it is, even though the intellectually they understand markets can fall, they don't believe it because they've never seen it. Now, the expansion ends when new supply growth equals new demand and the equilibrium is reached at 11. Now, this is again, because there's that lag, right? The lag is very important of new supply coming in the market because of the development timeline. You know, it's one, two, three years perhaps to get a new 
a new property online. So meanwhile, you know, as the economy is expanding, you've got more and more demand for apartments, but the, the supply is not catching up. Well, it catches up at point 11, and then you flip over into hyper supply. So this is when new growth uh, in the market exceeds new demand and the market tips into hyper supply. Now, this happens because there was so much construction that was approved in phase two, and it's all now coming onto line in phase three, and so much so that new supply is exceeding demand. Now, what happens at this point is that occupancy rates start to trend down back towards that long-term average, and competition for tenants starts to intensify a bit in those new build properties. However, because occupancy is still above that long-term average, rents are actually still rising in this period. And this is a problem for trying to figure out where you're on the cycle because most market participants don't recognize that the market has tipped because occupancy is still high and rents are still rising, right? So you, what you'll see is decline in the growth rate of rents, but rents are still growing. So a lot of investors will say, hey, rents are still growing, market's expanding, let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, the key here, as I said, is to notice that the rate of rent growth is slowing. That's what you wanna look for. And uh, if supply continues to exceed demand, then you tip into phase four. Now, again, I want to just emphasize this point again, that it's called the hyper supply. And generally speaking, this is about uh, new, uh, new development exceeding the, the demand for apartments. But it can, the, the shock can be on the demand side too. If the economy tanks, then demand can dry up. And that can, you know, you could have a market that was in equilibrium, but suddenly it tips into phase three because the demand dries up. So it's not always a supply problem, it can be a demand problem. All right, so the next phase is the recession phase. And this is what happens when the occupancy drops below the long-term average because new supply continues to come onto the market even though there's no demand for it. Now you're in the recession phase. Now, at this point, landlords start to realize they're gonna lose market share if rents are not competitive and they start to offer concessions and lower their rent. Uh, and they will actually lower their rent if they have to uh, as low as they possibly can, uh, they can't lower it past the point of, of uh, covering their fixed costs, but they will go that low. So they will go down, you know, to the point where they're making no profit at all just to stay afloat. If they have to go down past that point, then they're looking at foreclosure unless they have outside resources to pay their mortgage. Um, at this point in the cycle, there's basically no liquidity in the market to buy deals because owners are asking too much. They're looking for that peak pricing still and bidders are looking at the situation going, wow, there's too much risk for me. I'm not bidding, I'm not paying that. And things kind of grind to a halt. Also, you've got lenders backing out at this point for the same reason or, or being more, uh, I should say more, more picky about the deals they invest in. Um, the length of this period depends on how bad the overbuilding was or how, uh, how bad the supply drop off is, sorry, the demand drop off is and how long that oversupply, however it's created, is reabsorbed by the market. And the cycle ends, the phase ends, and the whole cycle ends when new market demand once again hits that, one, that point one where new market demand just barely starts to exceed new supply in the market and you have positive absorption again. All right, so just an overview of what we've just covered, uh, just so you can see how this all fits together. So you've got uh, in, in the recovery phase, you've got negative or uh, below inflation rent growth at first till you hit that 0.6, where you've got long-term occupancy average and the rent increases are equal to inflation. Then you've got accelerating rent inflations in phase two, accelerating rent increases in phase two past the point of inflation. When you hit that 0.8, uh, then you've got really high rent growth. And that's when everybody starts saying stuff like, oh, this is gonna go on forever. It's a new paradigm, what have you. You know, nobody wants to buy property, you know, they want to, don't want to buy homes anymore, all that kind of stuff. That's what people are saying at this phase. You hit that equilibrium point and then it tips over into hyper supply because all the new supply coming on is exceeding the amount of new demands. You've still got rent growth, but it's decelerating back towards that long-term average down towards point 14. And when it crosses point 14, now you've got declining rents and uh, you've, you've got, you're into the phase four and you're ready for a new cycle to begin. All right, so hopefully that was not too confusing. Let's talk about risk through the market cycle, okay? This is a prelude to the psychology bit. So market risk through the cycle. So we have seen just this uh, 
graph a minute ago, but I think one thing that people, and we're gonna talk about this, this bias, but one thing that people tend to miss about investing is that prices and risk are inversely related. So you have your long-term cap rate average, right? So you all understand what a cap rate is. This is the, uh, the unleveraged return on your property. So if you don't have a mortgage on your property, this is the return you're gonna get if you pay all cash. So that the long-term cap rate average tends to exist around the same time as the long-term occupancy average. When you're below that, right, you've got, uh, you've got above average cap rates. So property is cheap, but they're falling. You're starting to have a little bit of uh, compression of cap rates, uh, but you're still below, you're still above that long-term cap rate average uh, until, you know, while you're below 0.6, sorry. Then uh, when you get into expansion phase, your cap rates are falling more rapidly. Um, you've now got below average cap rates, so you're, you're past that long-term median average, but cap rates are still compressing. If you flip into hypersupply, you've still got below average cap rates, but they're either flat or they're slightly decompressing, but nobody's really paying attention because uh, it, it's kind of, it still seems like a hot market. But then once the market notices the supply demand equation and rent starting to fall, you have very rapid decompression. Uh, and this can happen very, very quickly. And you go back to above average cap rates. So uh, this is the point I want to make before. As prices are rising, this is what people tend to miss because of the biases that, that we have, the, especially the herd mentality bias, right? The, as cap rates are falling and prices are rising, your risk is also rising because you are, you are going above that long-term average, right? And if you understand markets, you understand that there is always in the long-term reversion to the mean, right? Because if cap rates are below uh, their long-term average for a long time, it's going to encourage new development. It's going to encourage new supply to coming into the market, or it's going to deter renters because it gets to, uh, sorry, buyers because it gets too expensive, what have you. So there's always going to be that, that undulation, right? That wave function above, above and below this long-term occupancy and long-term cap rate. But the, the point to, to remember is that as prices rise, risk rises too, even though it feels the opposite way. And the opposite is true, all right? As prices are falling, it feels more risky, but your, uh, as your prices are falling and your cap rates are rising, the risk in the market is falling as well. And I think the way to think about this is kind of like potential energy. That's the, that's the analogy that I was making. You know, the higher that you raise the ball up in the air, the more potential energy it has to fall. And as it falls, that potential energy is, is being depleted until it hits the ground and has no more potential energy, right? Uh, the only way is up. At the same, you know, the same point, the other, there's a point in the market where there's only one way and that's down. Uh, so think of it in terms of potential energy and you'll understand sort of how the risk uh, the risk profile works. Okay. Now, as I just alluded to, the highest risk for buying is up here. It's precisely at the point where it feels really good, where everybody around you is buying and talking about how great real estate is. This is when the risk is highest. And the risk is lowest at the point where everybody is talking about how terrible real estate is and how you shouldn't invest in it and you'll just lose all your money, right? So uh, this is the reality of the situation. And now we're gonna talk about how you marry them together. So investor psychology through the real estate cycle, this is investor psychology plus the real estate cycle or investor psychology starting with a C. All right, so market psychology. All right Now, at the risk of gross oversimplification, oversimplification, I'm going to say that the difference between the great investors out there and average investors is that the great investors master market psychology while average investors are mastered by market psychology, all right? And looking back again at this same slide, we've got prices going up, right? And risks going up. And the great investors understand this relationship and the average investors don't because they're paying attention to what everyone else around them is doing. So now seeing this graph, I, sh I assume that all of you are saying, well, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't get more aggressive as prices were going up. I'd think it was more risky. Now you'd think that was true, right? 
you would assume that most investors would feel very aggressive early in the cycle, knowing that things are going up and they'd be more cautious as markets rise past that long-term average. But in fact, the opposite is what tends to happen because of cognitive biases, because of market psychology, right? So I'm just gonna walk you through the process of what tends to happen with people's thinking. Now, after a correction, memories of investor losses are fresh in everyone's mind. And even though risk is at its very lowest point in the entire cycle, the recency bias operates on most investors to make them fear the market at this point. They listen to other investors talking about how bad, all the bad news and the her mentality operates to keep them on the sidelines because they're afraid of losing money. They think because of the recency bias that because the market has recently fallen, it's going to keep falling forever. Okay. Now, what happens though is the smart money, those sophisticated investors, the one who master market psychology start to buy. And once they start to buy, a few people start to notice. The sort of the smart money moves first and then the early money follows them. So you've got the smart money moving, the early money watching them and taking notice. And as prices start to, to rise, you get a bandwagon effect begins to develop. So as the bandwagon get, gathers strength, the cheerleaders start to get louder and louder and louder. It starts pulling more and more people into the market. And this causes prices to rise, which in turn increases the bandwagon effect even more. And it becomes, depending on how you look at it, either a, a virtuous cycle because prices are going up or a vicious cycle because risk is going up. Now, at some point, the smart money starts to notice that risks are rising along with prices and they start to sell. Maybe they don't even feel that the market is super risky, but they feel like they've made money. They're going to start taking some chips off the table, maybe invest in something else where they think that the risk reward profile is better. They generate profits and those profits only encourage a greater bandwagon effect as people on the sidelines see how much money has been made. Then the herd mentality and FOMO, the fear of missing out, starts to kick in. The power is increasing. It starts to overcome the fear of the people who are sitting on the sidelines, drawing more and more people in because everyone else is doing it. And the recency bias of the crash begins to be replaced by the recency bias of prices rising. That's all people remember. And some people are not even involved in the market you know, before the crash or during the crash, and they only come in afterwards and all they know is rising prices. Now the herd mentality is at a very, very strong point. And we had a strong point at the bottom of the cycle when everyone says real estate is bad. When you get to the top, you have a herd mentality uh, bias operating in the other direction, saying real estate is good and it's never going to fall. And so precisely when the risk is highest, the average investor believes the risk is at its lowest because everyone's buying real estate, right? All the TV shows are about real estate. Everyone's talking about real estate. They're, every person in the world has got a podcast about real estate. It's, you can't escape from it. And so everyone thinks, well, everyone's doing it. It must be safe. Now, this is what Buffett is talking about when he said, you know, the quote I, I, I put up earlier, most people get interested in an investment class when everyone else is. Okay, this is, Buffett is a master of market psychology. And this is, you know, he's spot on with this comment. And you see it in every cycle. Now, what happens at this point is confirmation bias sets in for average investors. It's uncomfortable for people to contemplate risk and loss. So psychologically, they need the market to keep rising. And I have no evidence for this, but I, my pet theory is that people kind of know in the back of their minds when things are overpriced and, and they buy out of FOMO, they buy emotionally, but they're really worried about how they made the bad, this bad decision. They need that market to keep rising psychologically because they wanna be confirmed in having made a good decision. So what happens is they start expressing anger at people who express opposing views, who start talking about the risk that's in the market or talk about the possibility of market correction. Those people get really beat up on. And every time the market doesn't correct, what the, bear, the bulls will say is, see, you're wrong. It didn't correct. Well, you know, that doesn't mean that the market risk isn't there. You start hearing justifications for why it's acceptable to pay over market, you know, pay to overpay, right? To pay cap rates that are wildly above love the long-term average to pay, you know, you start hearing justifications as for why it's okay to pay to buy this asset that's been traded two or three times already in this market cycle, right? Same property, maybe it's been rehabbed once, but it doesn't justify the additional uh, cap rate compression, right? So you hear justifications like, 
well, the Fed won't allow a market to crash. The Fed will pump as much money into the system as it has to to keep the market from crashing. Or there's a new paradigm that will keep the market high forever. Nobody wants to buy a house anymore. Nobody will ever buy a house anymore. So we don't have to worry because rents will just rise forever. And if you say something like rents are rising past the point of people's ability to pay, then either you get met with anger or you get dis met with dismissiveness, right? And that's what you see happening at the top of the market when people are invested literally and emotionally in the market being high. So at this point in the market, the smart money is extremely cautious and either they're doing deals very, very selectively or they're not doing deals at all, right? And oftentimes it's at this point where some external event intervenes to upset the apple cart and change the supply demand equation causing a correction. These things tend not to sputter out on their own. They tend to set themselves up for some external event to disrupt the apple cart. And then the whole process starts again. Right? You go back to the beginning of the cycle and all the psychological sort of baggage that comes with it. All right, so in, in sort of graphic representation, you've got uh, the most sophisticated market, market participants entering early and as the market climbs, it draws in more and more inexperienced people. It also draws in more and more ironically risk averse people because you know, the people who you know, are, are having you know, P PTSD from that last crash, the people who are most affected by it and sit on the sidelines the longest, they're the ones who get drawn in at 0.9 and 10 because they're finally convinced that it's safe. And it, it's too bad for them because then they're, all of their biases are gonna be confirmed because they're, they're buying right before the crash. The smart money is buying here early on, right? Because it understands these dynamics. The new and cautious investors are buying up here, right? Because either they're inexperienced and they don't understand, or they've been drawn out by the good news that seems to go on forever. And oftentimes, guess who's selling to whom? It's those early smart investors who are selling at what they believe to be ridiculous valuations to these new investors and laughing all the way to the bank. And as we have already covered, you know, these sophisticated investors understand the directionality of the risk, whereas the inexperienced investors don't. They, they think it's inverse, right? So, but the risk and the price are, go hand in hand. All right, and the process also works in reverse. If prices are falling, your risk is falling. You've got those late buyers, right, who came in at the top and they bought, and now the things are falling out, you know, underneath them and they want to get out. They, want, they desperately want to sell everything because they want to cut their losses. And they're unable to sell. And prices, you know, they, they, they don't give in to the, the market reality until this point when they capitulate. And what they really ought to do is just hold at this point, but they don't because they're so psychologically worn out that they sell at bargain prices. And guess who's buying again? It's the smart money buying those deals back in a sense from those people. All right, so we bring ourselves back to Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, once again, secret to success. We simply attempt to be fearful when others are greedy and to be greedy only when others are fearful. Fearful. Now, how does this work in the context of multifamily real estate? Well, when occupancies are rising above their long-term average, this is going to cause investors to become greedy and it drives cap rates down because they start, they feel that the risk is lower because occupancies are very high. This is the time of maximum optimism. So as, as, a, as a Sir John Templeton would say, he phrased the same thing as Warren Buffett a little bit differently. He said by, you know, the time of maximum optimism is the time to be uh, where the risk is the highest and vice versa. So the time of maximum optimism is when occupancies are at their highest. And this is when you should become fearful and stop buying or consider selling, or at least become very much more selective and, and concerned about where the market's going, become much more conservative, uh, as opposed to what you see happening all the time is investors um, loosening their standards in order to get deals done, okay? That's what the typical investors do. They just want to do deals. They start, they ignore the risk and they loosen their standards. On the other hand, when you've got occupancies falling below their long-term average, so this is phase one and four, this will cause investors to become fearful and it drives cap rates back up. 
But this is the time of maximum pessimism in the market. And this is the time when you should become greedy and start to buy like mad because you can make mistakes in this part of the cycle and have them covered up by the market. Whereas that when everybody is gung ho for real estate and overpaying, you can't make any mistakes at all. Any mistakes will kill you at that point in the market cycle. All right, so once again, just representing this uh, uh, graphically, we've got your long-term cap rate average. Um, below that, you've got in phases one and, um, sorry, this is actually an error in here too. Uh, sorry, this is, so phase three and four should be reversed. It should be below average cap rates and above average cap rates, but we've covered this already before. Point 11, the point I want to make with the slide is that point 11 is the point of maximum enthusiasm, maximum risk, and minimum reward. So your, uh, your cap rates are lowest, means your unlevered returns are lowest. So that is the point where you've got the most risk and the least reward, and the point where we've got the minimum enthusiasm, the minimum risk, and the maximum potential reward is here at point one. Now, uh, where are we now? Before I jump into this, I just wanted to make one other point, which is that you know, one of the big differences between the, the smart money to really sophisticated investors and the unsophisticated investors is that the, the, the smart investors, and this is where I want you guys to get to, is saying, what is the cap rate that is required to get me to part with my money, right? They set up first, what is the cap rate that I need to pay? Or what is the cash on cash return that I must receive in order, me, in order for me to feel safe enough to fork over my money. And that's what they're operating at, no matter where they are in the market cycle. The average investor though, asks the question like, what cap rate should I pay to get a deal? Essentially, if you tell them pay a zero cap rate, because that's what the market is trading at right now, they'll say, okay, I'll trade it by a zero cap rate because that's what everybody else is doing. I guess it must be okay. And those are really the two, if you want to, encapsulate them into like the most fundamental basic differences between the smart money and the average investor, that's the difference. The smart money is only buying when the deals fit its criteria and the, the dumb money is just buying, okay? Because they think that getting their hands on deals is all they need to do, all right? So, so let's tie this all up before Q&A, where are we now? All right, so it's very difficult right now to determine whether we are in the third or fourth quadrant, either the hyper supply or the recession. And it's because things have happened so rapidly with coronavirus, we really don't know where we are right now. Uh, as I, to remind you, the tipping point can be caused either by an increase in supply or a decrease in demand. There was some evidence that we were entering, at least in some markets, an oversupply situation before COVID hit. And now we have a potential demand side shock. And the reason that we're not sure where we are is because we've got contradictory information coming at us from all sides right now. On the one hand, the bullish investors are pointing to the fact that we've had continued strong rent collections as evidence of continued demand for apartments and the justification for high prices, or what you're seeing is sort of like the, the fake contrarian investors. These are like the Jimmy Buffett investors rather than the Warren Buffett investors. These are the people who are the buy the dip investors. You know, they're so they're so anchored into rising prices, so anchored into FOMO that they want to buy fast before the market goes up again. But they also brag about being contrarian because they're like, oh, everyone's scared of Corona. I'm buying anyway. That's those are people who are catching a falling knife. They're not contrarian investors. Uh, but you're seeing a lot of that right now. And there and those people are operating on the combination of that psychological bias plus this confirmation bias. You know the psychological bias of the anchoring to the high prices, but they're also uh, they're, they've got that confirmation bias which says I'm a bullish investor, therefore the market has to rise. I'm emotionally tied into this. Oh, hey, look, strong rent collections, everything's fine. On the other hand, you've got bearish investors who are pointing to the likelihood of a demand shock, in the form of continuing a high unemployment, and the possible end of government support, uh, or at least a partial withdrawal or a tightening of government support. And essentially, their position is, we don't know what's going to happen, so we sure as hell aren't paying those prices that, were, that we needed to pay two months ago, right? And that causes a disconnect in the market, as I talked about before. My personal belief is that the relief programs are going to continue. Congress is going to pass phase two and maybe phase three of COVID relief. 
but unemployment is going to remain high and uh, the, the benefits are not going to be as generous because the Republicans will push back on them. Not, they're gonna start really being concerned about the, the incredible budget deficit. Uh, so there will be some continued benefits. I think also with reopening of the economy, a lot of people won't be eligible for unemployment and they'll have to go back to work in some cases at lower money. Um, and I think that what's gonna happen is revenues are going to begin to fall at apartment complexes because of this. And as a result of that, buyers are gonna become much more cautious and they're not gonna pay peak pricing anymore. Uh, really, no matter what happens, I think buyers are, the, the bubble is burst in buyers' minds, most of them other than those, you know, buy the dip people, the dips who wanna buy the dip. Um, and I think the bubble is burst. You've already seen capital expansion. Uh, nobody knows how to underwrite deals. Everyone's feeling more risk. The lenders are feeling more risk. That changes the equation. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Q&A. If you guys want to learn more about me and my programs, I've got a download um, that you can grab at, uh, my, at my website, which is multifamilylaunchpad.org, and you can, as Raj said, join my, my Facebook group, Multifamily Investment Community. I look forward to seeing you all there. So, so um, Matthew asks, precisely at what number point, one through 16, are we in mural chart currently? And then Julian says, based on the market cycles, where do you feel we are right now? Which is basically the same question. And why do you, when do you think we'll be hitting the bottom of the market? <sighs> I, th th those are tough questions to answer because it's really, um, well, I'd say we're probably somewhere in phase three right now in the hyper supply phase. Although it's not showing through in the data yet. There's gonna be a lag, I think. And, and it may take a little while, but the reason I say that is because, uh, we're seeing some softness in collections. I mean, it's been pretty good, but it's, it's still a couple of points off and depending on the asset class, it's as much as seven points off. Um, that translates into a big NOI hit and, and a big loss of value. Um, but in terms of the demand too, I, I think that, I think, I know there's some leasing activity continuing, but the, um, you know, typically spring is the big, the really big leasing season. We've missed that. Um, even though there's been some traffic, I understand that that leasing velocity is way down. People are kind of staying in place. They're, if that's happening, they're not raising rents. I know a lot of syndicators I talked to, the very first thing they did when the lockdown started happening is going and offering their tenants uh, you know, long-term leases with no rent increases, uh, you know, anything to do to keep them there, keep them paying, you know, giving them uh, breaks if they paid their whole year in advance, all kinds of stuff. So I think we're gonna see no, um, no uh, rental increases at all this year and, and probably next year. And, um, but meanwhile, we've still got completions coming through. And once that happens, um, this all could unravel. But I, if I had to take a guess, I'd say we're somewhere in phase three, but it's, it's really difficult to say exactly because we just, we're just not, the data is incomplete and, and who knows what's going to happen with the government support as well. So um, I don't know, but we're definitely not at, at point 11. And, and, you know, I didn't put it in the presentation. I went and found the most recent uh, one of Dr. Mueller's uh, uh, market cycle reports that I could find since there's always a, a quarter lag time. If you don't pay the, the most recent ones from the fourth quarter of 2019, there was not a single market, that was earlier in the cycle than 0.11. Almost so every market was at 0.11 or beyond. And about, let's say the, the split was about half. So half of them were sitting right at 11 and half of them were already tipped into phase three. Uh, and so I think that the, if you withdraw demand because of coronavirus, it's gonna tip into phase three. Um, in terms of when the market bottoms, I mean, we'll have to, you know, what's gonna happen in the, this is gonna be a really weird recession because the, the, the third quarter data is probably gonna have the, the strongest economic growth ever recorded in the history of the country because they're just opening stuff up and people going back to work. So we're gonna have like some incredible growth rate in the third quarter. But that doesn't mean that, um, so we'll be like technically done with the recession, but that doesn't mean that things are good. You know what I mean? Like there's still gonna be a lot of people unemployed because we're coming off such a low low, right? So we could have 
you know, 25, 30% economic growth in the third quarter, but that's only going to return us to 80% of where we were. Uh, you know, I'm just pulling numbers out of the air, but you know, the, the point is because you're off a low base, uh, we're not going to be back where we were. So we're going to have to, before we really start seeing the, the bottom is when we start approaching um, something akin to where, you know, where we were before. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, I think Shelly asked the same question. Shelly, by the way, is batting 4 in these webinars because she's been on every webinar and asked a question on every webinar. But I think Shelly looks like you got your answer. Uh, Gaurav, Gaurav says, how long these market cycles last typically? Heard it's about 15 to 16 years of time frame in real estate. You know, typically there's seven to 10 years. So, uh, you know, there's, there's been this um, really stupid infographic floating around for the last few years, basically since the real estate cycle passed the seven or eight year point, which where it typically ends. And it's uh, this, this thing that says there's your know, real estate cycles last 18 years and the, 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 the exceedingly stupid thing about this, this infographic is that it's based on one city, Chicago, not real estate in general, it's based on one city, Chicago, and it's 18 years, except for when it's 46 years or six years, right? And it's all based, and it's all skewed by wars and whatnot. There were a couple, of, there were like three or four cycles where it was kind of around 18 years, and then it got crazy for 80 years. And then it kind of went back to one more that was 18 years. And it's all based on one data point, Chicago. Um, and people have used this to try to argue, oh, look, the real estate, it's fine. We have nothing to worry about. We're 10 years into this thing. We've got eight more years to go as if these things were, you know, mechanical, which they're not. Because they, you know, they depend so much on psychology, which we've just been talking about. So um, that's, Bollocks, and if you ever see that thing, just throw it into the trash right away. Uh, typically, the cycles are, are lasting seven to 10 years. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, even, you know, sort of 2017, 2018, we're already, it was very common to hear in the real estate industry that, hey, we're an extra inning. So if this were a nine inning game, we're already in the 10th or 11th inning. Uh, so the idea that, you know, it's 18 years is, is, is laughable to me, seven to 10 years. Okay. Uh, Marina is asking Jonathan, does different classes have different, slightly different timeline? Um, maybe a few months off? I mean, there might be some lag, but generally speaking, they're going to be more or less the same. You might have, you might have, you know, uh, I'm just talking about multifamily, right? So if you're talking about ABC properties, uh, they might have a different lag. You also, for, for subsidized, if you're like hundred percent subsidized property, uh, there, this, the cycle will probably be a lot more muted because the demand is always so strong. And then, so the cycle, the pricing cycle is dependent only on investor risk perception, sort of like how much risk uh, profile, you know, what, what uh, risk adjusted return they need. But your NOI is not going to change a lot because there's so much demand for those apartments um, that, you know, they're always oversubscribed all the time. There's always a waiting list for those apartments. But for the market rate stuff, they're, they're pretty related to each other, you know, and I think that um, what you'll see, what you see in a declining market is the phenomenon of flight to safety, right? And so there's two related things. There's, and they're, they're mirrors of each other. There's the, there's the chase for yield and the flight to safety. The chase for yield happens in a rising market where uh, investors can't get the yield that they want in New York so they then go to Charlotte and then the, the cap rates get compressed there and they can't get the yield they want. And then, then they go to the next market down. Right. And they start, uh, then they're like, well, you know, at, at the, at the beginning, they're like, Oh, we only invest in a properties, but then they're like, Hey, look, the returns on B are very attractive. And then the returns on C are very attractive. And they're just chasing, they're chasing yield down the quality ladder. Right. So they're investing in riskier and riskier and riskier deals to get, the same return. When the market flips, the opposite happens. You've got the flight to safety where they start unloading those, what they perceive as riskier deals and running towards, you know, the A or B class property in the biggest markets that have historically been the safest to invest in. 
So you'll see some kind of like lag time maybe between markets and between asset classes because of that phenomenon. Um, but they're, they're related, right? So they're, they're, the, the phases are not that out of sync with each other. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, Jonathan, Ty Din is asking, how, does, how has this pandemic changed your way of underwriting? Well, so I, I, listen, I, I've, I sold everything last year, right? I thought that the market was already overvalued last year. Um, obviously could not have predicted COVID, you know, it took me by surprise, like everybody else. And all I can say is I just feel really thankful that I did because I'm not dealing with it. Um, but it hasn't changed my underwriting at all because, you know, I already felt the market was overvalued and then this happens. So I hadn't really actively been underwriting deals. I tend to stick to uh, the way that I underwrite them, right? I want them uh, to meet a certain return hurdle, which is very, which was basically, you know, very difficult or impossible to find at the, at the top of the market. If I were looking at deals now, and I'm really getting back into it now, I mean, I need to, I think that, I mean, I was already doing, at the top of the market, I was already doing this, right? Like, where the way I was thinking about deals is you need to underwrite a lot of uh, economic vacancy, a, a lot of economic vacancy. You need, to, you need to be looking at deals with low leverage. Um, I mean, we'll get to a point where, where you can become more aggressive in your underwriting. Although, I mean, I, I don't really think you should ever be more aggressive in your underwriting, but you can kind of get away with a little more wiggle room at the bottom of the market, but we're not there yet. I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that, like, who knows? I just don't, I don't know where we are, to be honest with you. Like, I don't know what the data is because I don't know, like, can you trust the numbers for rent collections if it's because of, uh, government, you know, relief, right? Like, can you trust the numbers? When do people's savings run out? Like, we just don't, we don't know any, these are all variables that we can't answer right now. So, you know, I, if, if I were in a position of saying, I absolutely have to do a deal today because somebody's holding a gun to my head or like if I didn't, or, you know, I'm trying to complete a 1031 or something like that because I, ha I absolutely have to. But even a 1031, I say just pay the tax. Let's just say you're going to pay 100% tax if you didn't invest the money. You know, some crazy situation like that. I would say you have to, based on the numbers that you're receiving, which are historical and have little to do with COVID or really we just don't know if we can trust them. I think you have to put like a really, really large economic vacancy factor on there, like 25%, 30%, something, uh, something really that you wouldn't do ordinarily because you just don't know. You kind of have to, un you have to assume the worst case scenario right now because you just really don't know where things are. Um, and at and, any and rate, I don't think that deals are gonna get done right now unless they're distressed deals because the sellers are still anchored to those peak prices and they haven't really been forced to move yet. Um, so we're gonna enter that period where buyers are feeling very risky and sellers are feeling uh, that they want what they want and, and deals aren't going to get done. So. Yeah. All right. That's, that's fair. Um, Andrew's asking Jonathan, why, what are the key data indicators that you look at to determine where we are in the market cycle? Where are the best source? Where are the best sources to get those from? Is it rent property values or new construction? Well, I mean, the various market cycle indicators are, are good. There's, there, like I said, there's Dr. Miller. There's another one floating around that, like, the, um, the name is escaping me. Who puts that one out? Um, but, like, I tend to look at, it's funny, because so this is the data-driven analysis group. I, I look at, actually, more sort of soft factors in the market like you know are brokers calling me up asking me to buy deals as opposed to asking me to sell deals you know like are they are am i seeing deals languishing on the market for a long period of time and seeing price cuts right am i seeing there's little indicators like um 
So this isn't really directly answering your question because I, I, I can't tell you sort of what point on that cycle we are, but if you see like indicators of little tells, like uh, deals, at least if we're dealing with larger multifamily, when it's a buyer's market, uh, all the deals suddenly have prices attached to them, right? Because the brokers are trying to anchor you to a price and keep you from underbidding by too much, right? Whereas when it's the seller's market, everything is to be determined by the market because they're worried about inadvertently anchoring you to a high price that you won't bid over. So you start seeing stuff like that that tells you this is the time to buy. So it's not, I don't really look at things sort of like mechanicalistically uh, as, you know, this much supply is coming in the market and absorption rate is this or that. It's more like, do I have the bargaining power or not? And I can tell if I have the bargaining power by the, by the attitude of brokers. And when you're talking to brokers, if they're telling you like market cap rates are softening, right? The market cap rates are moving up again. You can get this deal at an eight cap or at a nine cap or whatever it is. Um, that those are the things that I am looking for rather than some kind of, uh, you know, the number of permits that have been issued or things like that. Um, so, okay. All right. I think Shelly's asking interesting question here. Shelly says, do you think coronavirus is that black swan event that will make the Mueller cycle invalid? Well, I don't think the Mueller cycle is ever going to be invalid. I think that every cycle, there, there's always, in every cycle, there's usually some kind of event that upsets the apple cart, like I said. And so in 2008, it was the Lehman shock, right? That's, that's what did it. Um, this time around, I think it's COVID. The market sort of sets itself up. I mean, most investors have a bullish bias, right? And, and, and as I said before, the, the market cycle, it's slow to rise, but very quick to fall. And the reason for that is that it sort of, you know, it starts out from a low level and sort of grinds its way up and draws more and more people in. And, and it, ri it rises very, very, you know, sort of slowly over time. And it's all based on, on confidence, essentially. Like, you should go and read the book Irrational Exuberance by Robert Schiller, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics. He talks about markets. Uh, essentially, like, it's impossible to tie market sentiment to any actual data in markets, right? It's, it's all about positive and negative feedback loops, which... It, is directly what this presentation was about, that you have these positive feedback loops that develop, they feed upon themselves. Information feeds on good information, draws more people in, draws, you know, as you climb, you get more and more risk, risk averse people being drawn in. But then what happens is when you reach a certain point in the market, if there's an external event or something happens, the confidence, it's all based on confidence. The confidence disappears overnight. The confidence doesn't gradually add out of the market. Confidence is either there or it's not. So what, what happens is, you know, the COVID issue has really undermined confidence. Now you've got some battling forces now where you've got the people who believe like the Fed is all powerful and they'll pump enough money into the system to, to support prices. Um, I, I personally don't think that the Fed can overcome a confidence problem, no matter how much money they pump into the system. If people, you can't make people borrow money if they don't think they can pay it back, no matter how cheap interest rates are. Um, so once confidence is undermined, um, it, it's undermined, right? You can't, you can't get it back until, until you get to a point where things have fallen so low that you start getting those bottom feeders who are like, gosh, it's so cheap, I can't possibly lose, or I'm willing to lose this much money because the, the risk is low. Once they start getting into the, to the market again, then you start, that's when it bottoms out. So I, I see a lot of people also making, you know, saying, well, the, the stock market is doing this. So what about the real estate market? Stock market has bounced back. I think the stock market is much more sensitive to cheap money. Uh, there's a lot of trades made on margin, but it's also very easy to exit trades on, on Wall Street, right? You can't, like, you can, a lot of people can take a position just to ride it up because they know that if sentiment changes, they can sell out. There's always somebody to take that opposite side of the trade. In real estate, once sentiment changes, you're stuck. There's nobody buying your property if, if confident, you know, if they decide that the value is less 
than what you think it is. I mean, you can sell for what they're offering, but you can't sell for what you want. And what they're offering may be below what you paid for it. So th that's the difference between those two markets. One is a very liquid market. One's a very illiquid market, even though when, the, when things are going, going well, there's a lot of liquidity, but it's essentially, it's not a liquid market, right? It takes, you know, 30, 60, 90, 120 days to complete a transaction. We've seen what happened in that period of time. You can have COVID happen in the middle of that. So um, don't make the analogy to the real estate market, to the, to the stock market. It's not, not an, uh, an apt analogy. All right. Um, I think uh, Richard Hall says, great presentation. Thank you, Jonathan. At what point do you feel new construction, uh, i.e. supply, becomes a headwind to B and C class apartments? And do you feel COVID-19 driven property amenities and procedures, more touchless online virtual leasing, staggered common areas, ETC will matter as much as lux luxurious amenities? Those are two big questions. So read the first part first and then I'll answer that in the second part. Okay, so the first part says, do you feel the new construction, i.e. supply, becomes a headwind to the B and C class apartments? Yeah, I mean, so the markets are related to each other, right? They're not completely, they're, it's not like three silos that are completely independent. What you'll have is if you have a lot of um, oversupply of A, there, there's gonna come a point where they start poaching B tenants, right? They're, they're going to get to that point if they can, unless they're you know, completely, you know, because of the construction costs, can't get their rents that low. But they're going to start trying to go after the strongest B tenants by offering concessions and essentially saying like, hey, come and get this brand new top of the line apartment with all the best amenities for, what, for only a little more than what you're paying for your B property, right? So, so that, and then it just filters down. Then the, you know, the B properties are gonna be panicking and they're gonna be looking to poach the best of the C tenants. And the problem with the C tenants, C properties is nowhere else to go, right? So you've also been hardest hit by uh, the economy because it's always the C-class tenants that are um, most at risk of losing their jobs. So uh, definitely, yeah, but there's a lack, right? It's not, it's not all instantaneous. There will be some, some, some time uh, gap. And in terms of when it happens, well, I mean, it really depends, I guess, in, in the market or sub-market, how much oversupply there's been and how desperate those A-class owners are to to poach the B class and, and, and on down. So it'll, the process will take a few months maybe. And the second part Excuse of the me. question was, uh, do you feel COVID-19 driven property amenities and procedures, such as more touchless online virtual leasing, staggered common area use and higher cleaning protocols will matter as much as the luxurious amenities? I think that's what it means, lux amenities. Yeah, I know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, maybe in the short term, yes, you know, but if you're talking about trying to, I'm not, I, I guess I'm having a little trouble understanding sort of the context for the question. Cause if you're, if you're trying to say, well, Hey, I own B property and I'm going to institute all these protocols, will that overcome all the nice amenities at the A property? Um, you're, you're asking apples and oranges question because why won't the A property just go and suit all those protocols too? Exactly. Exactly. And That's then they'll have, then they'll have both. Yeah. Right. So uh, I think, you know, rent is important. Like amenities are, are fine, but at the end of the day, so there are a lot of price shoppers out there too. And I think price is going to become probably more of an issue than anything. You know, people don't, they, they might, at least in the short term, being a, they just aren't going to go to your gym at all, right? And they don't care. They're just going to hunker down in their apartments. Uh, you know, so it might not matter what protocols you have in place. It, won't, it just won't matter to them at all. What, what might be more important to them is if they're feeling um, a little insecure about their finances, then, um, you know, that, what you're charging for rent might be the key determinant. I think in a recession, people are going to be more about rent sensitive, yeah. uh, for sure. Great. I think, let me just check. Okay, we have six more minutes till 8.30 Eastern time. So I'll you know, do a few more questions. And then if some questions get unanswered, then you know we'll respond by email and Jonathan will help us do that. 
Um, Naveed asking, uh, is it true that each city slash state is in a different phase of a market cycle at any given time, Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, that's true. But what happens, it, it, there are definitely like local market factors that can impact things for sure. Um, but I think what's happened over this, this particular market cycle for a bunch of reasons, one is monetary policy from the Fed and other central banks around the world. Another is um, the, uh, the increased attention being paid to multifamily because of podcasts and bigger pockets and meetups and everything that's going on. I think the market has become much more of a national market than it was before, at least from the investment side of things. Obviously like the rents and occupancy and things like that are, are gonna be a little more determined, sort of uh, impacted by what's going on locally in the market. So I think it used to be very much the case that you could have parts of the country that were, you know, in one part of the cycle and parts that were other, in other parts of the cycle, depending on what the local economy was doing. I think that's less true than it used to be. I think the market is much more of a national market, certainly on the investment side of things. There used to be the case people just didn't invest unless they were like, you know, institutional investors. They didn't invest all over the country. They just invested like in their own backyard. Now you've got people investing all over the place. So it, it's become this national market. It, it, and also I think that what happens also over a very long cycle, the way that we've had here, like in the last 10 years, they all sort of eventually catch up with each other when the cycle is that long, right? There's not, you're not, you may find in the beginning of the cycle, you know, markets that have started recovering sooner than others. I think there's more diversity early on because different parts of the economy will be hit harder than others and take, and because of the economic factors in that market, they're gonna take, the, the recovery speeds will be different. Um, you know, if you looked at the last cycle, you know, real estate prices and places like New York City and San Francisco and Boston, they dropped by like 15%, right? And they started recovering pretty quickly. Other markets dropped by 50% and it took them years to start recovering. Um, but at the top of the market, now they've also, there aren't really any markets that haven't recovered. And people ask me this question a lot, like, hey, what are the emerging markets? Like, there are none. There are no emerging markets, okay? Just face up to it. You might've heard that at some seminar, oh, go look for emerging markets. There are no emerging markets. Now there will be again, in another two or three years, but you know, as of January, 2020, there are no emerging markets, okay? If they haven't emerged by now, they're never going to emerge or some, they have some major problem with them, right? Um, so, but at, right now where we are at the end of the cycle, it's all sort of the same. But I think going forward, like, you know, there are gonna be some markets I think are gonna crash harder and sooner than others, like Las Vegas. You know, Las Vegas is a market that I would only go near. I would not consider investing in that market except at the very bottom because it's so, it's so discretion, discretionary income dependent. It crashed the last time around because as soon as the crash hit, people stopped spending money on, you know, junk hits to Vegas, right? And other, other markets like that that are completely dependent on tourism, like Orlando, uh, and maybe there are some others. You know, I've always been extremely scared of Houston because of its dependence on energy, right? And, um, and even though it keeps on talking about how it's diversified its economy, it hasn't really diversified its economy that much. So certain markets like that are kind of obvious ones that I think will crash harder and faster, and then there'll be opportunity earlier. But other, other markets are gonna be a little more similar to each other as, as kind of like the country has, um, economies have come to look like each other in different parts of the country in a way that they didn't used to. Um, we'll take this one last question, uh, Jonathan. Donna Byron is asking, where do we look for, uh, where do you look up long-term average occupancy for a neighborhood or a zip code? Do you look it up by MSA? Uh, that, well, it's very, it's actually not easy to come by this information, right? So, um, but, it, but I think, so talk to brokers that they're like your best source and try to find the brokers that have been around for a while, right? Because the new ones won't, new ones will say, oh, it's 98% because it's all, all they've seen. You know, the standard long-term underwriting uh, kind of convention was to underwrite for, at 5% vacancy all the time. Uh, 
because sort of that's kind of what like what the long term vacancy was. But obviously, it can it can vary from market to market. Um, you know, you might want to pay if you're really interested. You might need to pay for a subscription to like a co-star or something like that. Uh, but it depends on how far back their data goes. I I know that like Reese, for instance, I used to subscribe to their data and uh, they only went back five years, right? In the reports you got. So if you looked at the report from 2011, you saw some really bad data because it covered the recession. If you've got the report now, it all looks great. So I think th the real information comes from like long-term brokers and maybe other long-term investors in the market who can can tell you those facts or also you know potentially um under like underwriters from banks if they've been around for a long time might be you know make friends with those people they can tell you the other thing too is as far as the subscription services are concerned if you don't want to pay for them uh if you have if you're friends with brokers or and mortgage brokers they'll always give you that for free yeah. if you ask them so they have subscriptions they all have subscriptions and they can print out unlimited reports and if you ask them like, hey, I'm looking at this market, can you give me the report? They'll send it to you, so. Great, I think it was uh, an amazing hour and a half session. Oh. I don't remember the time went by and we- I'm sorry, I, 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 sorry, just Raj, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Census data, the census department tracks that. So look at the census data. You can buy those reports you can download mm -hmm. like way, way back. So I'm sorry for not remembering, but look at the census, US Census Bureau. So that's sorry to interrupt you, Raj. No, no, that's a great point, great point. Again, thank you so much today, Jonathan. This was absolutely amazing session. And I can, you know, I'll probably have to go back and listen to it again. I've already heard this thing twice, but <laughs> this, this thing never gets old. It is so entertaining and so informative. And I want to thank the participants, uh, I mean, who are, you know, took the time from their routine today to attend the session. And thank you once again, Jonathan. Good night. You're welcome. Thank you, Rash.